Hello everyone, my name is uh, Sasha Kusluch from Music Tribe, as uh, Michael just said. Uh, I'm very glad to be here today uh, in this fantastic venue in this very, very modern and dynamic university. Uh, what I'm going to tell you about today is digital signal processing as a service, and I'll define that uh, during this talk. So I come from company Music Tribe, which uh, was born from, uh, initially from Brown Behringer, so this picture here is Uli Behringer himself. Uh, he started making synthesizers in the, from 1989 and then became very, very successful with that and then uh, at some point started uh, acquiring other companies. Uh, the first acquisition was in 2009 was uh, Midas and Clark Technic. Uh, Midas consoles are, are quite well known. Actually, this uh, event is being mixed right now. The audio is being done on a Midas console uh, at the back of this room. Uh, other famous brands uh, in, uh, include um, uh, Midas, Tainoi, TC Electronic. TC Electronic is very famous for guitar pedals. I don't know how many guitar players there is uh, here today. But anyway, uh, we can uh, essentially cover uh, music performance production and live uh, performance and also listening at home uh, from the end to end with uh, Music Tribe equipment. Uh, the team I'm heading is uh, the Advanced Signal Processing and Artificial Intelligence team. Uh, ASPI, we have uh, 12 team members, uh, we actually have open positions, so if some of you are looking for a job in uh, anywhere, actually we don't hire only in the UK, but uh, we, we work uh, remote, we have people in Denmark, uh, UK, Sweden, uh, and so on. Uh, we uh, have diverse backgrounds in the team, so uh, some uh, of our research engineers are specialists in machine learning, other ones are specialists in digital signal processing. We will also have software developers, uh, specialists in uh, acoustics and room acoustics, uh, one person who is a human computer interaction designer, uh, and then we have a, a, resident, a resident music producer uh, and a musician, effectively. And core innovation is part uh, of the company's digital transformation. Uh, this type of industry was so far based mostly on hardware, uh, designed in Germany, manufactured in China, sold to the rest of the world. Uh, but uh, now it's undergoing digital transformation to add more uh, software services uh, around the devices themselves uh, and uh, make, uh, uh, make their capabilities uh, wider through uh, software, cloud, and so on. So if we map the life cycle of a music project, when we do music, if we look at from the point where someone plays a guitar, sings a microphone, up to the point where uh, you listen to the music in, in, your, in your home, what happens? So the first thing we think of, of course, is the musical performance. Uh, you're making music with music instruments or with uh, MIDI controllers which are going to control synthesizers. Uh, so in that space are bronze, are TC Electronic, Behringer, TC Helicon, Bugera and Aston microphones. Um, this, this is not only about the bronze, it's also about uh, how those things interconnect. So what you perform in terms of your audio tracks uh, or your MIDI controls are going to go into your physical or digital uh, audio workstation. Um, so, uh, as I said, this, this, this room is being connected to uh, a physical uh, uh, mixing uh, desk where the, where the audio uh, control is happening, but you can also control your audio on a laptop with a uh, DOS software. So in that space, we have Behringer, Midas, TC Electronic, and so on. So once you have mixed and mastered your, your piece of music, your audio, uh, you can send your master to, to being published somewhere. We're not active in that space uh, at the moment, but so you can imagine that your uh, music piece of music uh, is going to uh, either the big platforms, uh, Apple Music, Spotify, CD Baby, and so on, uh, or to platforms which are more geared towards uh, semi-professional musicians, which are trying to kind of go around the, the system of, uh, of the, the majors for music licensing. So Jamendo, Bandcamp, DistroKid, you can, anybody can uh, 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 publish their, their music through these platforms. Uh, or you can publish in, on social networks, uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, Twitch, uh, TikTok, and so on. I haven't mentioned all the social networks, but essentially that's also a good way to get your music uh, to, uh, for, for people to listen to your music. And then, uh, of course, at some point, you need to play back the music in some environment. So uh, Tano is one of our brands making uh, audio, what we call lifestyle audio, so uh, loudspeakers and uh, stereo systems for people's living rooms. Uh, we also make headphones, uh, but there are many other ways you can consume the music on your mobile phone, your laptop, uh, your smart speaker, in your car, and so on. Uh, 
Now, another route towards uh, making your mu music uh, public is uh, live performances. Uh, so Music Tribe is active in that space uh, as well. So as much live performances on uh, music stages as in uh, 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 churches or in, uh, we count, uh, 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 conference rooms as a live performance as well. And again, we have many uh, brands uh, in that space. And then also uh, one uh, other thing which supports, which participates to that life cycle of a music project, of course, is the manufacturing. So we have our own factories. Um, cool Audio is, a brand, is one of our brands which makes semiconductors. Uh, we don't do the distribution ourselves, but we have very solid agreements with Toman, Sweetwater and many more uh, distributors uh, for these devices to reach you, to reach the musicians. You have to buy them from somewhere. Uh, and uh, one thing which comes uh, upstream from that whole chain of making and consuming music is uh, music education. Uh, so at the moment, uh, again, it's not something that Music Tribe does directly, but uh, we are uh, now active in putting some of our uh, tutorials of, on how to use our equipment on uh, edX. Now, uh, of course, this shows you where, where Music Tribe is active, but the interesting thing is the interrupt connection between all these blocks. Um, and, and they feed into each other in various ways. So the education gets you started into music. Uh, uh, if, you have, uh, uh, if you have brands which can communicate, if you have equipment which can communicate between the performance and the production that can make your mixing and mastering more effective. So interoperability is important. Uh, once you uh, uh, put your music in the public, once you publish your music, you are uh, also playing with a sense of community a community of music listeners, but also a community of music makers. Jamendo was based a lot on that sense of community of, uh, we like to make music, let's make it available to the rest of the world. And then again, once uh, you, uh, your music is in a, some kind of distribution platform, uh, it's important for, uh, that, that people have access to that platform through uh, mobile phones, stereo systems, um, and so on. So uh, uh, all these things are interconnected and for these interconnections to work, we need to have a proportion of that happening, re being relayed through software platforms, uh, web services, uh, cloud, and so on. It's not only about the devices, it's about how they are connected. Now, one important question is, uh, what if all audio devices, hardware devices had internet connectivity? How much of the processing that is currently happening on the device, the, the music effects, the reverberation, whatnot, uh, could happen in the cloud instead? And uh, also in that sense, what is the right balance between edge processing and cloud processing? What are the things that you're better off doing on the device versus doing in the cloud? Uh, and uh, so, of course, the first thought is, okay, is the internet fast enough to achieve this kind of thing? But cloud gaming now is very successful and is a proof point that you can do interactive services uh, uh, via, via the internet. So if we compare what happens on the device or the char characteristics at large of devices, hardware devices versus the cloud. So the devices have uh, on board a chip, which does the embedded computation. Uh, they tend to have limited storage because storage is expensive. Whenever you increase the storage, you increase your bill of materials. Whereas cloud, uh, uh, in, uh, as a concept, uh, could, you could store any amount of data in the cloud uh, and, and also can provide very large computational power. You can scale up your computation very easily on the cloud. Devices are fairly rigid. They're hard to update, upgrade or update. Uh, you need to do your firmware upgrade. Sometimes you need to plug some kind of uh, uh, USB key to, to do your firmware upgrade. It tends to be uh, uh, not, a, uh, not straightforward in all cases. Whereas cloud, you would have access, your services get upgraded automatically without you having to worry about it. You always have access to the latest and greatest. Uh, so it's very flexible, evolutive, and, and you always get the, the latest service, latest version of the service. Now, uh, devices uh, uh, are optimized to operate with low latency. Uh, electrons in a chip circulates very, very fast. Whereas uh, audio transport latency might be the biggest challenge when, when we think about processing in the cloud. Uh, now, back to the devices, usually you have your studio set up. If you want to take your studio and bring it somewhere else, it can be quite complicated. Some devices are more portable than others. Uh, but cloud inherently, wherever you have uh, uh, internet connectivity, uh, has that, that notion of ubiquity. Um, so so uh, the notion here is that you could produce your music everywhere. I'll come back to that during the talk. Devices tend to be uh, operating with specialized system on chips, uh, which are vulnerable to supply shortages. In the, in the COVID period, 
uh, it became quite difficult to get certain chips which were essential to the manufacturing of, of the devices. Whereas the cloud, once you have a, a cloud installation somewhere, you can first of all run it on com commodity hardware. You, you, you just multiply the same server uh, ad libitum. Um, and you can make economies of scale when you buy your, your, your cloud equipment. And once it's there, it's there. Um, and it's probably, I mean, apart from the internet access, it's less susceptible to shortages and alias of uh, supplies. Another thing which was really hard during the COVID was the complexity of delivery logistics and shipping containers themselves at some point became difficult to, to, to get to. Uh, so, so the logistics around hardware are, are quite complex, whereas with the cloud services, you're just a download away from uh, your service. So uh, now, uh, uh, starting from this idea of, okay, what would happen if, if we had uh, cloud connectivity on, on all the, the, the audio devices? Um, there is also something which is more on the creative side of things, which is creative ideas can happen, happen anywhere. Uh, uh, you're having a walk in the park, suddenly you think about some melody. If you don't have your equipment with you, uh, you, you might forget about this idea. So one interesting thing would be, can we make the music creation, can we support the ubiquity of music creation? So that goes with blurring the boundary between hardware and software. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, so you, you could imagine starting your music production project on your hardware console, um, and then uh, uh, continue it on your DAW where you might have some plugins and some software that you can't run on your, on your uh, hardware uh, uh, device. Although uh, consoles themselves now have touch screens, so this is an example of the Midas HD96, which is a very, very modern console where, uh, where you can run things effectively in the console, but they, they, they offer different possibilities. So if you can have some hybridation between the hardware and the software DAW, it starts becoming very interesting. And now imagine you're going out for a walk, uh, you have one, oh, I forgot to add reverberation to this track and so on, you spawn your mobile phone, you continue your project on a bench uh, in the nature, and then you come back and then you finish your project uh, in your studio or at home or wherever, wherever you are. So this idea of ubiquity is very, very powerful. And so uh, what ubiquity effectively means being able to create uh, uh, everywhere. Um, so uh, access this notion of ambient creation, make music creation tools uh, ubiquitous and easy to access anytime via uh, internet access. So uh, portability, in that sense, portability means smaller device or dematerialization through cloud access. Uh, the challenge uh, for that, of course, there are challenges in uh, getting the internet technology uh, up to speed with all of that, but it's, it's more a data challenge in the sense that uh, it's uh, quite difficult to describe music production uh, rather than uh, audio per se. Uh, if you take as an analogy the Microsoft Word, for example, you can write uh, collaboratively a Word document, but once you write your text, it's there, it's a fact, it's done. Uh, whereas music production is more about all the transformations that you're going to apply to a track. And that's quite uh, part of the research or part of the challenge is to uh, encode the transformation processes rather than the finished uh, track or the finished uh, audio. Um, so it's about merging dynamic descriptors rather than merging something which is uh, finished. Uh, and then also managing the collaborative aspects when it comes to music uh, is complex. What if you have two uh, collaborators working on the same track, one puts an effect in one place and then the other one puts the same effect. So the merging uh, logic is quite complex and that is the kind of thing which is part of research at the moment. So uh, another uh, key value of uh, doing all of that is to lower the barriers to making music. Making music is hard, like you need to have skills, you need to train your dexterity, your piano playing, your guitar fingering and so on. Music theory itself, when you look at this uh, music score, uh, can get uh, quite complicated. Um, music production itself is, is uh, quite uh, complex. Uh, so which equi equipment do you need to mix things? It took me years to understand why I needed a DI box. I'm still not exactly sure why you need one, but still I know that I need one for sure. Um, uh, 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 realizing how you make that s a particular sound, you, ha you hear something in a pop track and then you want to make the same sound in your production, how did that happen? Which kind of synthesizer or effects did they use? You, that takes years to get all that knowledge. How do I make my music, uh, my podcast, my production, audio production sound good? Uh, there are skills in that. Uh, adjusting your voice level against the music background is quite technical, quite complicated. Uh, mixing and mastering, where should you uh, color your sound or not, or how do you make various instruments uh, stand, stand uh, out uh, away from each other? Uh, what are the relevant audio effects? Should you apply reverb or not? Apply always, uh, uh, reverb always sounds good, but does it? 
So all of that is knowledge that uh, specialists develop over time, but that we want to make accessible or uh, that we want to facilitate for people who are just started in, in, in music. Another type of barrier is the cost, so money. We uh, make affordable devices. Actually, uh, Music Tribe Brands and Behringer in particular are known for uh, uh, twice the feature for half the price, and people are really grateful for being able to buy the devices just because we work really hard to make them affordable. Um, then affordable services, so it can be quite costly if you buy someone to help you to write your lyrics or someone to uh, make your musical arrangement uh, so, or mixing and mastering, mixing engineers and so on, that can uh, uh, augment your, the cost of producing your music. And then acoustic room conditioning, not everyone at home in their living room has some uh, audio padding or something. Uh, so many people uh, try to make ideal music in non-ideal conditions. Uh, so are there things that we can do to help with that? And then time and effort. Anything we can do to uh, uh, make the workflow of uh, mixing, mastering, production faster is good. Uh, 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 making the learning of music uh, or production faster is good. Uh, which services could, ta could save time and effort in that sense? So for example, mixing as a service, if we can make something uh, uh, very affordable, that, that helps people. So uh, in that sense, all these things can be helped with uh, automation, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. But uh, AI, in particular, artificial intelligence, requires lots of computational power. Hence, the cloud is a key enabling technology to actually lower the barriers to making music. Now, of course, I'm talking about artificial intelligence, but we need to be careful with that. Uh, the first reflex is, oh my god, you're going to kill jobs. Uh, you know, mixing and mastering is an art. Uh, AI will never be able to have the artistic flair of a of an uh, uh, engineer. But it's not, it's not about replacing something. It's more about empowerment. And there is that thin red line between, for example, auto-generating a melody uh, versus uh, helping someone to capture a meaningful melody, uh, something that they heard. So, uh, for example, transcribing the sounds that you hear in nature, something to give you, to give you nudges with your music creation. Um, and uh, AI, uh, uh, in some way, uh, is not very good at writing a whole piece, and we don't really want that because we also want the people's personality, narrative to get into their art creation. But it can get you out of the blank page syndrome and giving you those little kind of nudges, stems, ideas that then you can build on. Uh, or, uh, for example, if you're not a drum player, you're a very good guitarist, you're a very good piano player, but you've never done drums. Uh, you could have assisted accompaniment making a drum track uh, for you, which could be some kind of uh, initial ID that then you can uh, use to communicate more effectively with the drum player or that you can use to you know, manipulate in, in some other ways. Uh, so the, 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 the allegory here is on the one side, side of replacement, we have the Terminator, oh my God, uh, the AI will replace us, which is absolutely not what we're talking about. And on the other side, we have the Iron Man, where the, the uh, skeleton around the Iron Man, uh, the human is in it and is still making all the decisions and deciding where this power is going to go. But then it's making him stronger, faster, uh, enhancing his perception. So we have other examples of that. Uh, auto mixing is not what we want to do. What we want to do is to improve the engineer's uh, mixing and mastering workflow. So reduce the time on tedious tasks. So comping, for example, when you have to select the best takes uh, out of, uh, of uh, 10 takes, it's extremely time consuming, extremely uh, tedious. So if we, you have something that can flag certain characteristics of the music, it makes your workflow faster, less tedious. Um, suggesting presets can be useful. Uh, and that, to an extent, participates from a superhuman perception, like uh, keeping in your mind the whole landscape of a track and all the instruments and everything that happens in there. It's quite a lot of cognitive load. And in that sense, uh, you could use AI to detect certain things. Oh, did you notice that you have a crack at the third minute of this recording? Oh, gosh, no, I didn't. So, so it's uh, really about this kind of notion of uh, helping people to be a bit superhuman, but still human. Or other examples, self-playing piano versus uh, augmented performance or style transfer is a thing. Uh, rather than uh, playing back the music, helping people to learn more effectively to play their instruments and so on and so forth. So just to substantiate that, I'm going to show you a short video, about two minutes, of uh, Rachel Meddings, who is uh, the resident musician in my research team. And she's going to tell you about how she uses uh, AI in her own music production. collaboration with a machine learning lyric generator that was trained on 18,000 of my lyrics. So it's essentially if I fed a robot all of my lyrics and it wrote a song based on what 
it thinks I know it as my own. And that's this song. I'm not built like you think I am Built like you don't need me Put my heart and soul into war And you have me defeated Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm a songwriter, producer, musician, and I'm a research music creation specialist at Music Tribe. After discovering the average number of songwriters on a UK top 30 hit in 2019 was 6.7, it became apparent that being a songwriter might not actually be a financially viable career. With 100 listens on streaming services generating as little as 34p, I didn't want to divide what little royalties I was getting in between an excessive number of co-writers. But I also wanted to maintain my sense of self as a songwriter and as an artist, and then that's where the idea of coding a co-writer came to mind. By training a machine learning lyric generator on my own music, I was able to maintain a sense of style and my own message, but increase my workflow by having someone or rather something to inspire and develop new ideas with. And it's not always been an easy process. It was a very steep learning curve and there's been a lot of interesting developments along the way, but it opened lots of avenues for collaboration and experimentation. And when music is so inherently human, there's no way that an AI can replicate what we do, but a little nudge goes a very long way. You told me you loved watching me fall. There's been a burnout for too long. You told me I'm damned if I let you in. You're the only one who gets under my skin. So yeah, this is Rachel. Uh, yeah, every time I see this video, I get a bit emotional because it's, it's really nice. It's really and, and it really illustrates the fact that uh, with a, we, the usage, the kind of usage of AI that we envision, uh, is very human. Is absolutely not replacing people. Is kind of giving people these kind of little nudges that, as uh, Rachel says, go can go a very long way. So just to summarize this first part of the talk, uh, what we mean with uh, DSP as a service is uh, these uh, ideas of the music journey, how we uh, link all these blocks in the music, music creation journey, uh, how we make the music creation ubiquitous, and uh, this notion of AI empowerment, uh, all of that together uh, sits in that notion of DSP as a service. Now, of course, the latency was the big red thing. Uh, is, uh, latency seems to be the big challenge. But is it really? When we start actually to put the hands in the research in degrees and, and to think about it, so first of all, we can uh, define three types of DSP as a service depending on the required response time. Uh, so uh, the, the easiest tier would be something uh, called DSP, uh, asynchronous DSP as a service, where the response time could be uh, above one second and up to next day delivery. For example, if you think about uh, mixing or mastering as a service, you could upload uh, your uh, tracks to uh, the service and then get your uh, audio file mixed and masters or your uh, uh, su audio suggestion or presets. They don't need to be immediate. You can get them in a few seconds or potentially if it's for mastering, you could get it the next day, which is consistent with what a mastering engineer would deliver. Um, if you think of device customization, so for example, uh, uh, some form of uh, room adaptation, you can upload your audio measurements to the cloud. Cloud does the computation that it needs to do, sends you back the parameters of adaptation of your, of your device. Um, and if it comes like a few minutes later or something, it's, as long as the value that you get for that weight is enough, then that works. Uh, assistance to composition, so same story, lyrics, uh, chords, uh, musical stems. Uh, uh, they don't need to be exactly uh, uh, low latency or real time if you get them one, one or two seconds later. So for example, when you're dictating a message on your mobile phone, the letters, the words don't uh, appear uh, uh, immediately. They appear with probably a quarter or half of a second. So these kind of uh, things are, are acceptable. 
Uh, the mid-tier is reactive DSP as a service, which we see as uh, consistent with uh, human uh, gestural re reaction time. I don't know if you've seen this kind of test where you drop a ruler and then you measure how quickly people actually catch the ruler. So how quickly does a mixing and mastering engineer react to push, to push a fader uh, after hearing a, uh, that something is happening in the audio? This is the, what we mean uh, with reactive DSP as a service, and that is reaction time between one second and 10 milliseconds. So things like, uh, uh, when an audio stream uh, comes into the service, uh, having uh, device control, for example, uh, automatic faders uh, uh, fading, as long as it's uh, uh, close to or faster than a human, then we're good. And that can be 200 milliseconds. Uh, broadcast processing, so things like when you stream audio to, uh, to an audience, so radio uh, applications, for example, internet radio, um, every service for internet radio at the moment has uh, latency between uh, half a second to uh, much more than that. Uh, so uh, even make, when you make a call through Zoom or through Microsoft Teams, it's not exactly real time. Sometimes you have these kind of little glitches when you're trying to kind of get into a conversation and because of the delay that gets messy. But still, uh, from the standpoint of what the service achieves, uh, for uh, broadcast processing or teleconferencing, if, you know, between a, a, a second or 10 milliseconds of delay is still acceptable. Um, things such as music performance, so uh, rendering, you upload your MIDI score uh, or some kind of text encoding of your music and then you get the audio track rendered. You could imagine having every single uh, uh, synthesizer ever made available in the cloud. And that, uh, if you don't get the, the, the transmission back exactly at, on the spot, that's still fine. Or the other way around, so uh, sorry, that was what I was saying before, like music transcription as a service. So uh, when you dictate your thing on a mobile phone, your, your voice on a mobile phone, that takes a few milliseconds to, to do the transcription. So you could imagine having a transcription from the music to the MIDI score uh, similarly. And that, again, that can, that can cope with a few uh, 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 milliseconds, I mean, more than 10 milliseconds of delay. Now, the challenging one, of course, is low latency DSP as a service. So things like uh, live mixing as a service where you have the audio stream and you need the, the corrections or the effects on the audio stream to work in real time, that needs to be under 10 milliseconds. Um, or uh, telepresence in the sense, uh, in the metaverse sense. If you start having a delay between the movements of people uh, and uh, their, what they say, uh, then that's going to become uncanny. People will very quickly realize that that, uh, that will imp impact the sense of reality that you get in the metaverse. Um, and then uh, live synthesis uh, as a service, so uh, when you play the uh, synthesizer device, you press the key, the sounds happen immediately. Uh, if you press the key, the, your key press goes to the cloud, generates the sound and sound comes back. Uh, that again needs to be uh, below 10 milliseconds to be comparable to what you achieve now uh, on board the device. So just a few fun facts about time, about these considerations of latency. Uh, so we set the bar at 10 milliseconds, but is it really that or do we have a margin around that? This is one of the very first uh, research questions. Speed of sound is 342 meters per second. So if you're playing in a, in a stage like this one where you're going to have uh, your fellow guitar player here and then a keyboardist and a drum uh, player here, you already have between 6 to 12 millisecond delay between the musicians. And 10 millisecond delay is actually the thing that's perceived by humans as natural. If you, ha if you have absolutely zero delay, that can also become uncanny. Uh, Philharmonic Orchestra would sit uh, across uh, 8 to 12 meters, which is uh, between 23 to 35 milliseconds. Uh, but they can see the conductor and speed of light being faster than speed of sound. Uh, the visual cues are compensating for the latency between musicians. Uh, if you consider a uh, rock band on the Wembley uh, Stadium, uh, that if, uh, assuming that the, the, that stage would take uh, half the, the, the width of the stadium, uh, you can have up to 100 millisecond delay if you're here and then uh, 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 somebody else, I don't know, Paul McCartney is there, then uh, uh, you can have up to 100 millisecond delay, but you would have stage monitors and, and most of the time actually in-ear monitors where again you use the speed of electricity to, to go faster than the speed of sound. And then at the extreme, if you have a marching band across the stadium, which can be the whole width of the stadium, you can have up to 200 millisecond delay, which is very, very noticeable. Uh, but uh, marching bands actually learn to compensate for that via a combination of visual cues because they're marching, but also they know that if they are a certain instrument, they should kind of uh, set, synchronize with some other of the instruments. It's quite complicated. And, uh, and actually, uh, it's, it's rare that a marching band sounds really good, actually, but it takes time to, yeah, anyway. Um, 
Now, if we look at the speed of light or the speed of information, uh, that's 300,000 uh, kilometers per second, give or take. Uh, so London to Sydney is 17,000 kilometers. Uh, that's a 57 millisecond delay in theory. Then you have other stuff related to networking that come on top of that. London to Washington is uh, 6,000 kilometers, that's 20, 20 millisecond delays, more or less. London to Paris is 400 kilometers. So if you were jamming with people from uh, Paris, or, or, or I don't know, Vienne to Paris, that would be that could be as low as 1.3 millisecond in theory. And if we reverse that equation, 10 millisecond latency gives us uh, 3,000 kilometers uh, at the speed of light. Uh, so uh, in that sense, the, the topology of the network matter. This map is uh, the servers from a company called Cloudflare, which is what is called the content delivery network. You have other uh, brands of content delivery networks. Akamai is one. Uh, then uh, Amazon Web Service themselves, they have zones. So they're not strictly a CDN, but still they're, they're, they're starting to zone things. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a way to compensate. If you send your uh, internet communications always to the closest server, then you're well, you might be well within the 3,000 kilometers that, 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 that is giving you this kind of 10 millisecond latency. And just for the record, speed of electricity, depending on what the cable is made of, can be from 50% to 99% of the speed of light, um, depending, yeah, depending, depending on the medium. So now, uh, of course, this is, in theory, how fast you can go in a fiber optic cable. Uh, but time spent before and after the network transport matters too. It's not only about the internet speed. It's also about how many milliseconds you save uh, before and after what you're doing. So, for example, there is a form of audio encoding which is called uh, Opus, and the algorithm to encode Opus requires 26.5 millisecond observation of the audio. I'm not talking about the time it takes to compute the encoding, I'm talking about how long a bit of, mu of music or sound you need to uh, observe in order to have the Opus parameters that then you send in the, in the cable. And uh, uh, the, you can do, in that sense, a trade-off between uh, the algorithmic delay, so that's called algorithmic delay, and the quality. So Opus, you can get down to 5 millisecond algorithmic delay, but that would be traded against the bitrate. So you have a, 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 a yeah, higher, uh, higher bitrate or lower quality if you go down to 5 millisecond um, algorithmic delay. So the things that you do before and after the network might be of the same order as the time you spend uh, in the network. So uh, now if we look at, the, this is going to be a bit of a technical slide, I hope uh, you're going to, to, to enjoy it nonetheless. So uh, uh, if we peel the onion off, uh, off what happens when we want to do audio transmission through the internet, so we want to send sound through the internet, that much we know. Now there's quite a big catch, which is the internet was not designed to carry continuous information, it was designed to carry information in packets and without time awareness. Whatever you send through the internet can happen, any, it can arrive anytime or even not uh, arrive at all. And it can arrive any time and also in any order. So the sequentiality of music is not necessarily respected in, in, in packet-based uh, transmissions. And there is that uh, notion of jitter, which is the variations of time between packet arrival. And so they arrive in any order, whereas music has to be on time. In terms of uh, media, so uh, hardware to, to, to do your internet transmission, you have the fiber, which can be optical fiber uh, cables. So transatlantic lines tend to be optic fiber, fibers or copper cables. Uh, so you've all seen like uh, digging in the sidewalk to bring you uh, high-speed internet. Uh, but that may vary. In some places you might have ADSL instead, which is a slower form of cable. Then uh, everybody's uh, uh, speaking and, and, and chanting the merits of 5G, which is the wireless uh, or in other terms radio broadband networking standard. Uh, it uh, promises low latency, but you have several ways of understanding latency in 5G. So uh, 8 to 12 milliseconds is the air latency, the latency within a cell of, uh, of uh, wireless transmission. Um, uh, now, if you uh, take into account all the kind of protocol things that need to happen, uh, you need 10 to 15 milliseconds between your mobile phone and the edge of the, of the 5G. So in the towers of 5G, you have uh, computer servers effectively. And so between your mobile phone and that server in the tower, uh, you have uh, about 50 milliseconds. Um, but then if you count uh, the backhaul, so the fact that the tower is connected to the rest of the internet via fibers, uh, you can have up to 30 milliseconds. Uh, uh, but that's what the uh, internet carriers uh, uh, advertise as what's achievable for their uh, consumer services. So can go up to 30 milliseconds already. 
Um, but now 5G is also um, uh, advertised to be very, very reliable and to uh, lose less uh, packets than you would have in the fiber, for example. Okay, so if we kind of go from the center of the unit, the sound, to the, the whole generality of sending something through the, through the internet, uh, so audio is uh, airwaves, you need to convert that into a digital representation to send it through the internet. Um, and uh, either you do just the sampling, I don't know how many of you are, are uh, actual technologists of music, but that sampling is just when you take one uh, bit of your waveform, uh, so in the case of CD quality, it's every, it's, you do that 44,000 times per second, and with those these kind of discrete points, you're able to reconstruct the waveform gracefully. Uh, so that type of encoding is called pulse code modulation. So that's the kind of quality you have in CD, or you did have in CDs, because nowadays nobody listens to CDs anymore. You have some services streaming in PCM, uh, so in that kind of full quality was recognized as uh, the, the type of encoding where uh, human ear cannot distinguish between digital and analog uh, encoding of audio. Or you can compress the audio uh, with a lossy encoder. So the, the encoder removes some of the information in music, but it does it in a way that it removes uh, the, the things that you, cannot, uh, that you cannot hear. And so Opus is a, a type of uh, audio encoding which is uh, very successful in many uh, audio transport standards. And it provides some kind of graceful degradation and uh, forward error corrections. So graceful degradation is when your network uh, speed uh, uh, becomes lower, uh, Opus also uh, compresses the music a bit more to, be comp to compensate against the fluctuations in network bandwidth. Uh, and the forward error correction is something uh, which helps when you lose a packet in the network, which helps to rebuild the missing information. Uh, so once you have your audio encoded, you need a transport protocol. So tr what the, the transport protocol carries the audio packets between computers, and that's the logic which does the handshakes between, the, between computer, between the transmitter and the receiver. Um, so uh, the, the transport protocol, which is very successful for audio, is called the real-time transport protocol, RTP. It's based on a, on a lower level protocol called the user datagram protocol, which is uh, fast, but does not guarantee that the packets will arrive. And that's as compared to another protocol called TCP, which uh, does a lot more handshake and loses a lot more time. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna send you an audio packet. Oh yeah, okay, go send the packet. Okay, did you receive it? Yes, I received it. So it's a lot more reliable, but it spent a lot more time kind of going back and forth of, did you get it? Yes, okay. So UDP tends to, uh, it, so RTP is based on UDP because it's, it's faster, but it's less reliable. Uh, now, one thing that, you, that RTP provides on top of UDP is time stamping of the packets, uh, so at which time they were sent, uh, and then uh, that allows for detection of uh, missing packets, um, and also uh, allows to put the packets back in order, and also to compensate for the jitter, because once every packet has a time stamp, then you can really resynchronize uh, the packets after they arrive. Now, in order to do that, you need uh, all your computers in your network to be a bit like Mission Impossible, synchronize your watch. Uh, so you have a protocol called Precision Time Protocol, which is a universal work lock to synchronize all computers across a network very, very, very precisely in a way that allows to reassemble those packets uh, without having any jitter between computers because all the computers in the network have the same notion of time via the PTP. If we go one layer up, uh, so uh, now that you have the transport protocol, all that is executed by your routers or your internet switches. And so the networking standards are the software which run, uh, so in those, in those internet devices, uh, and which decide which packet goes where and, in, and in, in which order. And also they determine priorities. You can have different priorities for audio video service versus uh, web, for example. Um, so uh, div serve is a simple kind of standard which allows to differentiate between fast delivery for audio and best effort for all types of traffic. Uh, so the, 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 there is an extra field in the packets and, the, and whatever router is uh, div serve enabled can look at that and say, okay, well, it's audio, I'm gonna send it faster. Um, you have another standard uh, which is kind of rising in fame now, which is the audio-video bridging standard, which is uh, promoted by the AVNU Alliance, uh, which, is a time which provides time-sensitive networking. So with the AVB standard, AVB code running in your switches and routers, uh, you can guarantee a, a certain bound of latency, a lower bound of latency uh, in your uh, audio and media transmissions. Um, so, yeah, now the, the, the issue there or the challenge is that uh, 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 not all the routers are uh, AVB enabled. 
So when you are in, in a managed network where you own all the infrastructure, you can make sure that all the bits and pieces are AVB enabled, but when it's the, the router which is in people's living room, it's not guaranteed that AVB is in there. So that's helpful, but, we're, but not necessarily widespread. Uh, and then on top of that, so uh, once you consider all these pieces, which encoding, which transport protocol, networking standards, but then other things which matter, such as uh, the security, encoding, encryption of your uh, transport protocol, uh, quality of service, how do you actually measure, how do you have your system measuring in real time the, the speed of your network and so on, then you need a full-fledged audio networking system or audio networking standard. So uh, WebRTC, so real-time communication, is, uh, was uh, promoted and, and, and developed largely by Google. Uh, originally, it was developed for uh, web standards at large, but nowadays the uh, cloud gaming relies uh, mostly on WebRTC. Uh, then you have other types of standards which were invented by or promoted by the Audio Engineering Society or the Society for Motion Picture uh, and Television Engineers uh, and so on. So AES 67, Ravenna, Dante, uh, SMPT 21, they are fully fledged networking audio system where these kind of norms or standards define everything that happens in the network, where do, should you use AVB or not, uh, what type of uh, time synchronization you use and so on. And they tend to be quite complicating. Co complicated. Uh, now, one uh, new kid on the block that, that took everyone by surprise was the uh, NDI uh, standard, which is uh, kind of like a transport protocol plus a codec. Uh, it provides device discovery, so the device uh, advertises, uh, advertises themselves on the network, so when you uh, open your audio system, you see who else you can communicate with on the network. Um, it provides, uh, you have a choice in that sense, uh, in, in that protocol between TCP or UDP, so you can uh, uh, increase forcibly the, the reliability of your packets, but that's if you have a, a, a very uh, high speed uh, network. Um, and then uh, it sends uncompressed audio samples, so you kind of have to use PCM un unless you kind of wrap something into NDI. Uh, and then provides forward error correction, uh, and so that's getting traction at the moment because it's royalty free and a fairly simple uh, application programming interface. Uh, so, so essentially for audio transport there is a choice, and that's again part of the research which protocol is the best um, uh, to uh, achieve this transport of uh, audio through the internet. So that's the whole onion, the, the successive layers. I hope that, uh, how to say, uh, uh, clarifies some of these notions because once you get into audio networking, you have all these kind of keywords jumping at you and so this is one way to make sense of them. So now the practical questions uh, to, uh, to consider uh, beyond internet technology. So uh, 20, 20 milliseconds is definitely achievable. I've talked to someone who was working on synchronizing a London studio to a Washington DC studio, and they were achieving a 20 millisecond uh, latency on a transatlantic line, but on a fully managed network. So what that means is that they were hiring specifically that transatlantic line for the service, for this synchronization application, and nothing else was transiting on the, that line that was uh, leased to them by an internet provider. But now what about commodity internet? What about you know, your grandmother's internet in her living room? Um, and and uh, in that sense, uh, we still need to remember that raw network speed isn't the only factor of success. So reliability, how much packet that's gonna lose or keep, uh, time management, uh, so does your grandmother have AVB in her, in her uh, router, uh, network topology matters, so do you have a, a content delivery net network provider uh, close enough? And uh, again, uh, uh, time spent before and after hitting the network matters, it's not only about the time you spend there, it's also encoding, buffering, rendering, all of that matters. So is 5G the answer? Uh, so outside of the 5G salary, the transport goes to the fiber. Um, now, uh, as we said before, 5G advertises 10, 15 milliseconds to the sales edge. But now, uh, that's what's interesting in those servers which are in the tower, um, uh, they are accessible for computation. And you have uh, now content delivery network providers getting close, intentionally closer to, five, to the 5G towers. Or you can uh, uh, rent a service on uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, which is called Amazon Wavelength, I think, where uh, uh, Amazon, again, located uh, servers close to the uh, 5G edge. Uh, and that keeps you within these 15 milliseconds. Uh, so uh, one uh, message here is that the agreements with uh, internet uh, service providers or content delivery networks uh, matter. 
uh, and we really need uh, 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 these to be wrapped into the service. We don't want to have to tell people um, uh, if you want to use this uh, beautiful uh, mixing mastering uh, as a service, uh, we, uh, you have to take, uh, I don't know, Vodafone or whoever. Uh, we want people to have the, just you know, open the service and that just works. And uh, another practical question is, what is the right level of involvement? Because in that, uh, across that whole uh, onion uh, of the internet, uh, where, where is it that uh, the innovation should happen? So should you program your own uh, protocol from the ground up, starting from uh, UDP, making your own packet encoding? Um, or perhaps from the RTP layer, which already is, uh, is one notch up in terms of providing time synchronization and all that. Um, sh or should you become a member of the uh, AVNU Islands or, or a s a Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers or Audio Engineering Society and then contribute to the standardization effort and then wait for that thing to become widespread or not? That's, uh, that's, that's one of the other, other level, which is uh, a higher level of, of involvement. Uh, or should you pay a license to Dante? Dante is a commercial company, it's not an open standard. And uh, that's the sort of make or buy decision. You could, you could buy the technology from Dante or lease it from Dante. Um, and, uh, and all of that also is related to clusters of influence. So it's, it's important also to remember that uh, EES is the, is the audio people, uh, WebRTC is the network people, Google, GAFA and all of that. Uh, uh, and uh, media industry people uh, are a, a whole other uh, group of type of influence where they have also their own, uh, how to say, uh, uh, other concerns such as the speed of image uh, uh, transmission or pushing for specialization standards because it's more about the films than about the music and so on. So I've said it many times, network speed isn't the only impact factor on quality. Uh, so now to the, on to the research questions. Uh, application design uh, matters. What is it that, uh, sorry, what is it that makes this uh, musician uh, smiley and happy to be uh, using the service? Uh, is the latency acceptable? Are the errors tolerable? Um, what's the, the minimum uh, acceptable quality? How many packets can you lose before the service becomes completely unusable? Uh, packet loss concealment uh, techniques uh, are crucial to, uh, to quality over RTP transport because as we said, RTP is, does not guarantee the arrival of packets. Um, and so this uh, picture here is a, a, a neural network architecture, so m machine learning technique uh, effectively, uh, which takes the past of the music that has already arrived and the pa last valid packet which was observed and then predicts the, the next packet. And so if the packet is lost, you can replace it with a predicted packet, uh, potentially with some uh, loss of quality. But as long as you can't hear the loss of quality, then that's fine, because it's better to have something that interpolates the music than to have a, a blank or a, or a crackle in the middle of your music. And so now if we, uh, if we extend uh, the, the logic of the packet loss concealment, so packet loss concealment re re relies on the predictability of music. And so a prediction you can have on a short scale, if you have a, a tone already, a harmonic tone, it's easy to predict that this tone will continue. Um, whereas if you have drum beats or events which are instantaneous, uh, they're much harder to predict, unless, for example, when it comes to the beat, you have a longer uh, exploration, longer observation uh, of the music. So there are really very, very interesting research questions beyond that, which are, um, so if we generalize the, lo the logic of packet loss concealment uh, and, and use the logic of generative synthesis, then uh, how much observation do we need to have? Uh, and then uh, in that sense, can we make the error correction a bit more specialized between the things that uh, uh, are uh, easy to predict, for which we can use packet, concealment, uh, packet loss concealment a posteriori, versus the things which we know through our, uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence analysis that they are harder to predict, those we could target for the forward error correction. And that I haven't done this type of research done uh, anywhere else of uh, using the sort of like contents and morphology of music to decide uh, how you will manage your error correction a posteriori or a priori. Um, so 
uh, in that sense, uh, latency management for DSP as a service may be a whole new research area. That's the one, one amongst others that we focus on at, at Music Tribe. Uh, it's multidisciplinary. It involves uh, uh, networking uh, knowledge, uh, digital signal processing, psychoacoustics for uh, how the error matters or not. Uh, also, uh, psychology of timing, because psychoacoustics for MP3 rely on the uh, instantaneous hearing, but like how much delay can you accept, all these kind of things. Uh, it's been done a lot for speech, uh, historically for telephony applications and for video, so cloud gaming, but also uh, streaming of, of, uh, of media entertainment uh, uh, is, is very prominent. And when we start investigating these things, we find a lot more literature about how to do fast transmission of images, but not a lot actually about how to uh, do a transmission of, uh, of audio beyond speech. And so uh, uh, doing, uh, studying the latency management across a network for uh, uh, music and for general audio as such uh, is a whole new research area. So that's uh, one of the things we do at, uh, at Music Tribe and I hope many of you will join us on uh, researching this type of area. Thank you very much. <laughs>